Welcome to Cryptic Accounts, a podcast by paranoid people for paranoid people. And this week on the show, we're covering Operation Gladio. I'm Patrick Ryan, joined by Dennis Cheney. Hi, Dennis. Hello, Patrick. I'm hijacking this week, man. I want—I got a bunch of stuff I want to talk about. <laughs> I appreciate it. You've been a madman with research lately. Oh man, I've spent—I literally loved, since last night about this time. I slept a few hours and have pretty much been in front of my computer researching. <laughs> otherwise, we've gone full paranoid. You, uh, yeah. From what I can tell, you basically. <laughs> researched like four shows on your off week so well i uh i i kind of stumbled upon what is going to end up being a three-parter um i think it, we might be able to cover it in two but there is just so much and it's just laid out so well um yeah we that one i'm really excited about but i'm not really sure exactly how i want to lay it out yet i'm going to look at it a little right. bit more but it's probably it's going to be a multi-part thing and it's going to be really good but uh, thank you all so much for listening. Welcome to the show. We appreciate you. We appreciate everything you guys have been doing online, rating, uh, subscribing, sharing it, all the comments, the messages that we've been getting. We love it. Uh, we're glad you guys are enjoying it. Uh, keep that stuff coming and keep on telling your friends and sharing and doing all that stuff because it helps us grow, uh, fuels us, and we love it. So thank you. Yes. Thank you. Uh, so Yeah. I guess we should just I want to get right into this because I do have a bunch of research. This is another this is a good one. It's going to tie into a lot of stuff that we've already talked about. And that was not actually planned at all. Like just I think we've kind of found our little realm of things and just stuff's overlapping really hard at this point. I'm pretty pumped. I was especially pumped when I found out so late that you had this all it just like dropped in our lap. So I'm really excited to hear what this is. And I've intentionally not read research this at all so yeah this is something i another thing that i'm like how do we not all know about this mm. already and i feel like a lot of people have probably never heard of this so um as usual all source information is at cryptic accounts.com under the sources tab and we're gonna get right into this so dennis in europe's new order they are the spies who never quite came in from the cold foot soldiers in an underground guerrilla network with uh, one stated mission to fight an enemy that most Europeans believe no longer exists. Theirs is a tale of secret arms caches and exotic code names, of military stratagems and political intrigues. At best, their tale is no more than a curious footnote to the Cold War. The question is if, at worst, it could be the key to unsolved terrorism dating back decades and decades. You got, yes. you got a good hook there. Okay. Strap in, buddy. Because uh, it's going to live up to all of that. So a clandestine operation codenamed Gladio created decades ago to arm and train resistance fighters in case the Soviet Union and its Warsaw Pact allies ever invaded. Operation Gladio was actually formally revealed in 1990 by Italian Prime Minister, uh, who? <laughs> our, our arch nemesis, foreign Gilio, names. Ooh, Gilio, I, I looked it up too, and I'm like, I should have wrote myself a little phonetic thing right there. Uh, I'm going to say Giulio Andrade. Andriati, I think is how it yeah. said. It's the prime minister. He was the prime minister in Italy in 1990. I'm sorry to anybody who's really good at speaking Italian. I butchered that name. And that's on me. That's on me. Uh, at this point, I think you come to expect that from me anytime I'm going to read any kind of foreign names. I'm probably going to butcher that. Uh, so in an official statement to the Italian parliament, our Italian prime minister had already been exposed in the courts and elsewhere but his official revelations widely exposed the unpalatable reality. Italian investigations into the years of lead. Now, if you don't know, the years of lead is a term used for a period of social and political turmoil in Italy that lasted from the late 1960s until the late 1980s. And it, mar it was marked by a wave of both far left and far right incidents of political terrorism. So that's where we're at. So the investigation revealed NATO's hand in a series of terrorist atrocities 
that had taken place in Italy throughout the 1950s to the 1980s. These included bombings, assassinations, kidnappings, mass shootings by terrorist organizations. There is no doubt that elements within the NATO deep state were routinely using false flag terrorism to control and manipulate public opinion to shape policy. The NATO deep state. Oh, yes. And I know that's uh, like a hot button term. This is all you're we're going to lay it out. This is all pretty documented and is a very real thing. Now, was this just in Italy or was this across NATO? Oh, not to get into anything. To, it's it's going to be across NATO and Europe, basically. Just yeah. Wow. Yeah. This it's, is so. This is a real life false flag, proven. Oh, not just one. Wow. Oh no, not just one. There's a lot of them. <laughs> we just keep getting more and more, uh, more and more black pilled every day on this show. Oh, <sighs> something. So, following the end of World War II, both the U.S. and British intelligence agencies were concerned about the possible invasion of Western Europe by Soviet Russia. Building upon their experience of supporting resistance cells and who fought against German occupation during the war, the U.S. Office of Strategic Services, the OSS, the forerunner to the CIA, and British Special Operations Executives, the SOE, who were eventually absorbed within Britain's Foreign Military Intelligence Agency, MI6 formed a number of clandestine military units throughout Europe. Some of these they called stay-behind paramilitary units, and they were built around resistance groups already in existence and more so in Scandinavian countries. Okay. Elsewhere, new units were created, drawing upon local assets and activists, often including far-right extremists. Neither the OSS nor the SOE were averse to using neo-Nazis, terrorists, as operatives, communism was perceived as the greater threat. So it doesn't matter who we're using for this, as long right. as we keep the communist boogeyman at bay. And I get it uh, at this well, time. Well, yeah, at this time. It is it, awful fast, though. I mean, you literally pretty much, if this started in the 50s, I mean, you, yeah, you even had, like, uh, put all the Nazis on trial yet. Nope. Oh, we're gonna we're gonna talk about that a little bit too. Uh, <laughs> Are you really a neo-Nazi if you're a neo-Nazi in the '50s? Aren't you just a Nazi? I mean, I, at what point at what point do you become a neo-Nazi? Like, I, think I, anything, I think it's anything past the Third Reich. So when Hitler falls, that's anything past that. If you're still a Nazi, you're a neo-Nazi. I don't know. I would assume you gotta wait like ten years to be neo. I. I'm just being. I feel like guy. there. I feel like there is a clear answer to that, and I do not have it. I'm sorry. <laughs> that's okay. Uh, so, com so like I said, communism was perceived as a greater threat. Its state atheism threatened the Roman Catholic, the Roman Catholic Church. Marxism threatened capitalism and the power of the banks and its adherence to international socialism, proletarian Itali uh, internationalism, um, focused upon class struggle, threatened the hierarchy of the Western establishment more right. than the Soviet Union. It, it's more than the Soviet Union itself. It was the potential thread of communist ideology, which came to be seen as the primary danger, something that had to be resisted at all costs. So, I mean, I'm not at this but point. What were the costs? Well, we're going to get into that. I mean, but it makes sense. Like, OK, so you defeat Hitler, you're crushing communism, communism scaring you, communism's bad. And I'm, we're not arguing that. But so it starts out, OK, you got to like have these groups set up because you can't necessarily get the military there in time. Right. So you need like these mil like like these sleeper cells almost that can strike unknowingly if communism suddenly starts springing up real heavily. It makes sense. Uh, freedom fighters were big against the Nazis, yes. you know, in France and elsewhere. So, I mean, the idea of having, good. Ba basically it's a militia. Well, yeah, and it's for a good cause. Like, I think we all agree with that. The way it's starting out, it's like, okay, you have a good mission. Like, you want to right. have something ready in case, you know, uh, the USSR starts flexing, basically. Right, right. So, 
we move into kind of what you were alluding to, which was, you know, putting Nazis on trial and dealing with the whole Nazi fallout. So the co-option of Nazi technological and scientific expertise was enabled through Operation Paperclip, which I believe we've talked about some. Some. It's kind of ever present whenever you talk about UFOs. Um, yeah. The deep and this state. time period, yeah. basically. Yeah, because it was yeah. it was essentially the I mean, top Nazi scientists, intelligence operatives, engineers and military strategists were either protected from persecution or resettled in the U.S. and elsewhere. Authorized by President Truman in 1946, who stipulated that no committed national socialist should be co-opted. The secret operation, nonetheless, supported many fervent Nazis. For example, Werner von Braun, who went on to become director of NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center, was identified as a potential security threat in 1947 and was considered an enthusiastic Nazi. Well, I mean, first of all, you want to talk about a life comeback story. Warner oh, Von Braun, man. I'm not even sure if it's a comeback story. He just kind of avoided any kept, consequences whatsoever. Yeah, he, just, he just kept doing his thing. Well, yeah. And I, I'm not going to get into, I think, a lot of my feelings. I, I don't know. Really, I, would, I would really have to look into that. I've very much gone back and forth about that whole thing. Like, Yeah, I mean, I get it. I mean, one they were part definitely, of me, Go ahead. Well, one part of me says... How do you tell who's a fervent Nazi? You know what I mean? Because everybody was a... Um, or at least had to know, act like it. it. Exactly. So how do you tell the difference between someone just acting and someone who's... And then that raises the other question. Do you just kill everyone who was a Nazi? Because that would just be everyone. And if you if you don't kill everyone who's a Nazi, then, uh, you know, what do you do? How do you decide? I, I don't know. And I think uh, we picked the um, best or worst of both worlds, which was just to... <laughs> take the useful ones and kill the well, that was essentially ones. what i was gonna yeah. try and get to was basically uh whether or not you were a fervent nazi kind of depended on your usefulness to us i feel like right. at the end of the day it was a utility decision essentially right so for him to get past truman's restrictions the war department's joint intelligence objective agency simply changed his file to read no derogatory information is available on the subject. Simple fix. Just, uh, you know, highlight, delete, then. No problem. That's the equivalent of someone looking through your browser history and it's just empty. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> it's like there's we something We can here. find no objection to this Nazi whatsoever. So approximately, and I had no idea it was this many, 1,600 leading Nazis immigrated to the U.S., to assist the West world's uh, the West Cold War effort, sixteen hundred of them. Wow! So we took the best and the brightest, and then some. I feel like I don't feel like those were all the best and the brightest. Well, you also have to consider Russia got a good chunk of them too. Oh, we're gonna talk about that too. Yeah. Operation Paperclip wasn't the only lifeline thrown to National Socialists. The West's concern about the potential Soviet threat led them to cooperate with suspected war criminals, hardline Nazis, and other radicalized groups in a variety of different ways. For example, Nazi intelligence leader Reinhard Geilen was supported to maintain operational control over a spy ne network of Nazis operating within the USSR. That one I never heard about. I hadn't either. It's crazy, right? <laughs> That'd be weird. You're a Nazi in Russia, and then the Nazi who's your boss calls you up, and he's like, hey, we're still Nazis, but we're working for America now. <laughs> I guess. I guess that's how that conversation goes. Like, I guess with your options of, well, they're either going to come after us, or we can now work for them. I feel like a part of what a Nazi is, though, and I don't know, but it's almost like... <laughs> part of Let one. me finish. Okay. Let me finish. Uh, is that they're going to go to wherever they can possibly still try and grasp at power. That's a hard one. Well, I agree with you on that, especially if you're a higher up Nazi. That's what but I I'm, mean. Like, I'm it, thinking it, of the Nazi on the ground, though, the everyday working man Nazi. Let's say, let's say you're a working man Nazi doing your spy operation in Russia. 
That's and then one day, and then one day, your your boss is like, "Hey guys, we work for America now." That'd be a really hard decision to make because now you're getting orders not just from your home country to be a spy in an enemy country. Now you're in an enemy country getting orders from a country that's not your home country who was country. just an enemy. It'd be really. It'd be really hard not to just go to the Russians and be like, hey, guys, I want to come well, clean with some stuff. I would assume you sell it as you want to remain undercover as a Nazi and sell this Nazi organization. Because in their mind, I'm sure the goal is still to at one point come back. I mean, as we know today, like they'd have to maintain their identity. Yeah, they'd have to. It's yeah. like the South will rise again. But the Nazis, I guess. I mean, it kind of makes more sense on why uh, that right there. I'm like, oh, well, that makes a lot more sense on why there's like still new movements of like neo Nazis. Because I'm like, oh, those guys get to stick around and talk about what they believed in everything, and like, uh, I'm just sure recruit new people. And yeah, it makes you wonder what happened to those guys. Like that would be its own episode probably. I'm just following this dude. That would probably be a fun episode. <laughs> Just following that group of spy Nazis post World War II in USSR. Oh, man. So another notable recruit was Lysio Jelly, uh, who was the head of the elite neo fascist propaganda do Masonic Lodge. Ooh, that's a tie in. Yeah. Again, unintentional. I thought I was done with the Mason stuff for a, a bit. I was going to back off of it. And they're not going to pop up a ton. But uh, just let you know, they're always swirling in weird world events that are going on at every point in modern history, pretty much. Yeah. Like, if there's conflict and screws being turned, there's a Mason nearby. I wonder what took precedence. Like, let's say you're a 33-degree level Mason. What took precedence during the war? Like, are, would you have more in common if you're a 33-degree Nazi Mason with a non-Nazi or with a uh, Nazi non-Mason? Or well, was there lines of communication between, like, the 33-degree Masons across the war? Like, like you would still talk to Masons in Britain and stuff like that? Yes, I, I, I think that, is you would still talk to other Masons because at that high level— you don't have a goal for any one country to win any conflict. You want there to be more and more conflict so right. that you can then swoop in with your agenda, which is to unify everybody under your flag and to have one world religion, one world government, one world currency. Interesting. So for there to be conflict, it's actually helpful for them. Like, I guess I'm just saying like factually, though, like what real when it really comes push to shove. Oh, they were working both sides, I'm sure. OK. All right. As, oh, as, I, okay, I get what you're saying. Yeah, that's what I think, is they were yeah. they were probably aware of each other. I don't know, because right. it's unclear how unified they are. Some are, seem to be more unified than others. Some are very independent of the rest of them. Right. That's what I was saying. I, I understand, like, and I would probably lean in favor of you, too, that some of them still communicated. But it is worth asking, like, in reality, when the bombs really start flying, like, are we still brothers or, like, what's going on here? I'm sure they unify to where they're at because that's for their own personal safety. Yeah, probably. Right. But still probably trying to turn things within there to create unrest, whether yeah. not on the global level, but at that yeah. point on the more local level. That I agree with you. Yeah. That I would assume is probably how they're communicating. But, I mean, based on what we saw between Albert Pike and Giuseppe Mazzini – I don't know that it really matters what's going on in geopolitical stuff when Masons are conspiring at the high level. Because, again, they've got their own agenda. True. So they're using all that stuff to their advantage, I would think. We're just going to have to become 33-degree Masons to find out, Dennis. I see no other way around this. We're just going to have to join. I'll this be a podcast is just going to end with us both Masons. We're both going to have alien wives. It's yeah, gonna and we're going to form a cult, obviously. Yeah, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> So, P2, uh, the propaganda do was also known as P2. So, P2's membership was formed from leading globalist and establishment figures, including armed forces commanders, secret service chiefs, heads of police, generals, admirals, newspaper editors, media moguls, top business executives, and bankers. Gelly's, or Jelly's, uh, Jelly, who had been responsible for the torture and murder of hundreds of Yugoslavian partisans during the war became a double agent for both the CIA and the KGB. 
The guy knows how to uh, make a living. I mean, double paychecks. I mean, you're going to be at both places anyway. Might be, as well. It would be hard not to be a double agent. I mean, you're fine. Especially out. if you didn't care. You're like, I'm a Nazi. I don't care about communism. I don't care about democracy. <laughs> Again, the everyday working man Nazi here yep. trying to make a paycheck. Yep, pretty much. Pretty We're going to get so demonetized before our YouTube even gets off the ground. <laughs> Please like, share, and subscribe <laughs> if, you're, if you're watching this on YouTube. Because we're going to get censored. We're going to need people to share it, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so he was uh, working for both the CIA and the KGB. So Jelly uh, was instrumental in the formation of both far-right and far-left terrorist organizations. A former associate and confidant of Benito Mussolini, okay. Jelly's connection to the global power elite uh, elites was staggering. For example, he was a close friend of Pope John VI, Juan Perón of Argentina, future Italian president Silvio Berlusconi, and Libyan dictator Muammar Gaddafi, in addition to many other global influencers. I kind of have a thing for Berlusconi. I think he's kind of cool, actually. Oh, we're not going to sidestep on this. <laughs> All right. Because he could probably be his own episode, honestly. He had so much stuff around right. him. I know. Man about town, that's all I'm going to say. So, while the world watched the Nuremberg trials, so we're finally getting to dealing with the Nazis, which supposedly brought Nazi war criminals to justice, Jelly was among those working with Western intelligence and other powerful institutions to facilitate the escape of Nazis considered too valuable for trial. For instance, using passports supplied by the Vatican, Jelly worked with uh, Galen, or Jelen to establish the Rat Line, as it was called, which smuggled Nazis to relatively, relative safety of Central and South America. Western intelligence agencies put their talents to good use. For example, Klaus Barbie, the Butcher of Lyons, was recruited by the 66th Detachment of the U.S. Army Counterintelligence Corporations uh, from his home in Bolivia. He later advised a number of governments on how to establish death squads with murderous success in Chile, Argentina, El Salvador, and elsewhere. We helped him. A death squad? What exactly is a death squad? I think it's pretty much exactly what you think it sounds like. <laughs> God, it's not funny, but it, I mean, I don't, well, you know, all right. I, I feel like that's one of those names that's right on the nose. Like, there's yeah. no... Right. I mean, oh, no, you can I just, like how they had his address. They recruited him for Bolivia. So you're just like hanging out in Bolivia and you get a letter and they're like, hey, we know where you are. Like, do you want to start a death squad? They were probably I mean, like I said, there was the rat line. He was probably smuggled there and they were aware of it the whole time. I feel like this this whole thing was left out of the uh, Will Smith movie. That's what <laughs> that was Suicide Squad. Oh, I'm very culturally illiterate. I, I see that. So the numerous, as they were called again, stay behind units compromised of a mix of covert foreign intelligence operatives or spies, national intelligence agency operatives, ex-military and security service personnel, along with volunteers. Oh, and terrorists. Well, yeah. Just, no, yeah, that was like just they were known as terrorists. Like they got straight up terrorists. <laughs> It's not like I mean, Al Qaeda kind of does it. Uh, I think it's where the volunteers and terrorists get lumped in together. You got your intelligence, you got your military, you got your security, and then uh, volunteers and terrorists go go well, that way. Somebody's got to set up the tables and make the punch and stuff, Dennis. <laughs> yeah. They're the low-level Nazis. Remember the everyman. Well, this is the everyman Nazi. So, anyway, okay, so. Historians, geopolitical commentators, and the official accounts came to collectively refer to the coordination of these various clandestine forces using the code name Operation Gladio. Quote, operating in all of NATO and even in some neutral countries such as Spain before its 1982 admission to NATO, Gladio was first coordinated by the Clandestine Committee of, Western, of the Western Union, the CCWU. Founded in 1948, after the creation of NATO in 1949, 
the CCWU was integrated into the Clandestine Planning Committee, Committee, the CPC, which was founded in 1951 and overseen by the SHAPE, Supreme Headquarters Allied Powers of Europe transferred to Belgium after France's official withdrawal from NATO from the NATO military organization, but not from NATO, which was not followed by the dissolution of the French state behind paramilitary movements. So French leaves the NATO military, but they're like, yeah, that weird group that we got over there, like hide and covert. Yeah, just keep them going. <laughs> wow, NATO is a lot more dark than I thought it was. I'd never heard of any of this. Yeah, I always I, thought NATO was like this fun thing where all the leaders get up and they go, "We'll protect each other." Yeah, this they is, mean it. This with is armies. some like dark stuff. Well, I know they mean it with armies, but I mean like I didn't know there's like secret things that NATO's a part of. Then there's like paramilitary things that you could not have control over. Well, that was the. No, point. You're right. They really mean it. I guess that's the point. Yeah. They, the they point. Really well, it. they kept it secret for years and years and years uh we're gonna get to it later i think it goes 40 it is 40 it's 40 years that it goes before it gets uncovered i mean okay at this point thinking about all this it, okay this this much makes sense if nato was one country it would not be that weird for it to have a military and a secret intelligence thing that would stay behind if you got invaded well, that's, that's that true would not if be it was weird. a country, but you, when NATO is a thing which is comprised of a whole bunch of different countries. It gets a lot weirder, but yeah. hear me out. What we normally think about NATO is that it's basically like the military for a bunch of different countries. So yes. it would make sense that there would be – it just at this point, it would make logical sense that if I had started NATO, I would also start secret NATO. Okay. Because it would make no sense to do NATO without secret NATO. You'd just be like, well, they got past our army. We're, we're done. Okay. Yeah. I'm glad. Okay. Yeah. All right. I'm glad you're on board with secret NATO. <laughs> we'll talk. We'll, we'll, we'll come back around to this later. We'll see <laughs> how you're feeling. So the existence of these clandestine NATO units remained a closely guarded secret throughout the Cold War until 1990, when the first branch of the international network was discovered in Italy. It was codenamed Gladio, the Italian word for a short double-edged sword, Gladius, uh, which is something gladiators use. While the press said that the NATO stay-behind units were the best kept and most damaging political military secret since World War II. Mm -hmm. The Italian government, amidst sharp public criticism, promised to close down the secret army. Italy insisted identical clandestine units had also existed in all other countries of Western Europe. This allegation proved correct, and subsequent research found that in Belgium, the secret NATO unit was codenamed SDRA-8, in Denmark, Absalon, in Germany, TDBDJ, in Greece, LOK, in Luxembourg, Stay Behind, in the Netherlands, INO, in Norway, ROC, in Portugal, Agenter Press, in Spain, Red Quantum. In Switzerland, P26. In Turkey, Ozel Harp Darsi. Um, in Sweden, Agag. Um, and in France, Plan Blue. And in Austria, OWSGV. However, the code name of the Stay Behind unit in Finland actually remains unknown to this day. So we don't even know what that one was called. Some countries did way better marketing their secret nato like i like plan blue yeah it's pretty good right i like uh absalon actually sounds kind of cool yeah red red quantum dude. that's the best spain has the best secret nato yeah they got flavor that's really what it is like they spiced it up good for them so consequently in 1990 the european parliament pub published its resolution on the gladio affair this single page document stated a number of known facts relating to the 40-year-long covert Operation Gladio. The European Parliament stated, and I'm just going to give a bunch of quotes of stuff they said about Operation Gladio. Right. In certain member states, military secret services or controlled branches thereof were involved in serious cases of terrorism and crime as evidenced by various judicial inquiries. These organizations operated and continue to operate completely outside the law since they are not subject to any uh, par uh, parliament parliamentary uh, control. 
and frequently those holding the highest government and constitutional posts are kept in the dark as to these matters. Various Gladio organizations have at their disposal independent arsenals and military resources which give them an unknown strike potential, thereby jeopardizing the democratic structures of the countries in which they are operating or have been operating. The resolution then recommended that the European government should protest vigorously at the assumption by certain U.S. military personnel at SHAPE and in NATO of the right to encourage establishment in the European of a clandestine intelligence and operations network, dismantle all clandestine military and paramilitary networks. The NATO, CIA, and MI6 response was actually very muted. They mm -hmm. partly refused to talk about it on the grounds of national security or military secrecy, but left the Italian and European parliamentary findings unchallenged. Which is just kind of, that's kind of how we always deal with things when we don't want to deal with them, isn't it? We don't deny it, we just don't say anything. Yeah. Which no response, I feel like, is a response. Oh, of course. Oh, of course. If someone accuses you of something crazy. And then you don't say anything, it kind of makes you look guilty. Am I the only one of us, too, that's kind of <laughs> proud to be an American? Like, we were, like, running Europe. We could have taken over Europe. I mean, it seems us like Us and Britain. It seems like, yeah, at one point we were really moving around a lot over there. Yeah, we probably could have. We probably could have taken them over if we don't want it to. <laughs> Which would have been weird. That would have been weird. Um, so, this was all as far as the official narrative went. The European Parliament charged its member states to root out the Gladio networks and directed NATO to shut the operations down. End of story. Oh, yeah. We're listening to that, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. That's, I mean, I'm done. That's the whole episode. They hey, shut you everything guys. down. They, they stopped. They said, we're very, very sorry. And then they admitted to everything they did and apologized again. Cause, oh, yeah. So, anyway. Cut it out. However, the extent to which NATO, as an intergovernmental military alliance of independent state militaries, was ever fully in control of Gladio is actually kind of debatable based on everything we know so far. It's not completely clear whether any of these countries really had control over or knew what these groups were doing exactly. Well, by definition, they didn't. Yeah, that was kind of the point, right? Yeah. Weird how that would backfire. So Gladio's use of stay-behind units predated the formation of NATO, as I'd said, in 1949. The plan was conceived by intelligence agencies, specifically the OSS, in, in, it's practic uh, the OSS and uh, SOE, um, its practical operation was overseen by their successor organizations, the CIA and MI6. Other national intelligence agencies were involved, though. Notably, the Italian, uh, I'm just going to say SID, it's their secret service. I'm not even going to try that one. But the ability of national security services beyond the CIA or MI6 to authorize Gladio operations remains in question. NATO's clandestine planning committee, under the auspices of SHAPE, was supposedly running things. However, by 1957, the operational control of Gladio had been brought under the control of the Allied Clandestine Committee, who were overseen by the U.S. Supreme Allied Commander in Europe. That's what I'm saying. This is America. This is the CIA having secret armies in our in our friendly countries. This is the same thing we do in every enemy country. Oh, does it seem like they're running everything in this show at this point? Is that... Is that what it's? Is that what? Is that what it's? I like? mean, it would make sense. That's kind of what it sounds like. It sounds like the CIA said, uh, "Hey, we got armies in every nation. Uh, let's have them in our friends too." Yeah, yeah. Hey, you know what that means, though. You know what? I, I can't. None of this really. This is really interesting, by the way. This is history that I'm so glad you're teaching me because I love stuff like this. But you know what? The more I learn about stuff like this, makes me realize there is. 99.999% without a shadow of a doubt, except for that 0.001%. There's one of these in America, is what this means. Oh, yeah. It, it, was, that's, that's all this means. Okay, yeah, I'll let you continue. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No. Uh, at there's some just, point, there's no I, way. Yeah. You, came, you, just, you came to that conclusion a lot quicker than I thought. <laughs> Not even, we're still back in the 50s right now. <laughs> Yeah. Well, you watch these patterns of how people keep secrets. It's not 
we've seen so many of this stuff come out. It's like, well, they only have one way of doing things. Uh, wait till we get into the types of things these organizations like to do. And you're really going to feel like, hmm, this sounds very familiar to me. Uh, how are we going to get into 9-11? <laughs> okay, let's go. Uh, I, I actually, we're not, we're going to probably brush past. Yeah, list. I know. Yeah. Uh, but no, that one I didn't spin off. Again, that could be its own episode, just the conspiracy, which kind of now makes more sense. We'll go farther into this. You'll see. So, okay. So NATO. Okay. So, however, by uh okay. It had been brought under the control of clandestine. Okay. So, and they were reporting to the Pentagon. In 1963, that command was taken by General Lyman Lemnitzer. Lemnitzer? He remains unique as the only U.S. general to have served as Army Chief of Staff, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and Supreme Allied Commander for NATO. Wow. He really, that, that guy had a career. Yeah. And it was him who approved Operation Northwood's proposal to use false flag attacks to provoke a U.S. military confrontation with Cuba, which is actually just that operation alone is on my list of things we're going to talk yeah, about. Yeah, we'll get to that for sure. That's a very famous one. Yeah. So whether he was a key figure in moving Gladio from a defensive to offensive operation isn't entirely clear. NATO have repeatedly denied freedom of information requests on the subject. However, his belief in the value of false flag terrorism and the timing of his appointment is it's notable. Mm -hmm. The disconnect between European states and operational management of Gladio was highlighted by French the, by the French withdrawal from uh, NATO in 1966. So uh, this did not coincide with the end of the French Gladio operation, as I said earlier, which is called Clon. Uh, Plan Blue. This suggested the distinct possibility that not all NATO-aligned governments were fully cognizant of what was going on. Another example of lack of governmental oversight was apparent with the Portuguese Gladio operation. The CIA formed an ultra-nationalistic right-wing organization called the Agenter Press. I believe I'm saying that correctly. It was, it was run by former uh, Vichy government operative and Nazi sympathizer Jean-Robert de Jernadec. Under the assumed name of Yves Guren Serac, I got that one, outwardly portrayed as a press agency, it was actually a front for the storage and shipment of arms and training of extremist mercenaries, many of whom received instruction in covert military techniques in the School of the Americas in Panama. Well, number one, you mispronounced. You keep saying Plan Blue, Patrick. It's Plan Bleu. <laughs> I'm sorry. I apologize to <laughs> French listeners. Um, so they basically used fake media outlets to move weapons? That makes you think. I, I, what, it, what, it was a weird one when I read it, but I checked it. It's, yeah, that was a thing. Remember our episode on uh, control of the press? Yes. Yeah. Man. Okay. Well, mm -hmm. go back and look it up, folks. Mm -hmm. It happens in America, too. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. So there's actually no evidence that the Portuguese intelligence agency, the PIDE, knew anything about the hidden agenda of the Agentur Press. Gladio was initially created in response to a genuine belief that the Red Army would invade Western Europe. Although President Roosevelt, Prime Minister Churchill, and Premier Stalin met at the Yalta Conference to agree how the post-World War II world would be divided, concerns about Soviet, Soviet expansionism held sway among Western intelligence agencies. Eh, can you blame them? No. Uh, yeah. Again, at the beginning, it seemed like it, it had a noble uh, kind of – it made sense. Yeah. I don't know if noble is the right word for it, but it made sense that we would do that as a defensive mood. And all these countries that have united it. I, yeah. So, okay. Gladio was initially created, like I said, as, as a response to genuine belief that the Red Army would invade Western Europe. Oh, okay, I already said that. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, subsequently released documents show the fear of foreign invasion was soon eclipsed by a desire to stop the rise of domestic leftist movements. 
a March 1946 memorandum for the attention of President Roosevelt called Soviet Foreign Policy Towards Western Europe stated, quote, through the national communist parties, the Soviets apparently intend to create leftist coalitions leading to a large measure of communist control in national governments. The document also outlined the Vatican's potential partnership role in opposing communism. Essentially, in Central and Southern Europe, at least, lines of conflict were drawn between the Catholics and neo-Nazis on the right and the communists on the left. So Catholics are taken on both sides. Vatican's having it out with both. They're, they're somehow the center, the centrist in this whole conflict. <clears throat> so this entirely, this wasn't entirely unjustified. Stalin was flooding Europe with Soviet, Soviet nationals and was actively supporting and promoting the wider growth of left-wing political movements throughout the continent. Right. Nor were the Russians above exploiting the talents of former Nazis themselves. Though their approach was far less accommodating than the West. Like I said, we were going to talk about this. Who Operation Osoviakim. Sorry. <laughs> Force I like how they leave the word operation in English and then yep. they don't translate the other. Okay. Nope. Just mess with me. And I did, that was one I meant to look up. I looked up a lot of them so that I could convert them, but that one I didn't. Forcibly removed Nazi scientists, technicians, and even their factories and research facilities. I don't know how you remove a factory, but okay. And research facilities from Soviet occupied territories to Russia, where the Nazis and others were compelled to work on Soviet Cold War projects. So in the U.S., we were a little bit more accommodating. We were kind of friendly about it. The Soviets were just kind of like, you're coming with us now. And you're going to have all that stuff over here. Please get in the cab. <laughs> this is comrade. This is happening. And then you go to you go to Moscow, and there's like a full recreation of your factory. And like, we moved it. <laughs> yep. Pretty yeah. much. This really, this smells like the same factory. It is the same factory. <laughs> it is the same. Would you like a potato? Uh. I mean, I get it. that's the one thing with the Cold War that people forget is like we always talk about how paranoid we were and stuff. And there was some stuff that happened, you know, with like MacArthur and stuff. But like we had really good reason to be paranoid. Like these people were yeah. the Soviets were extremely powerful. They had spies everywhere. I mean, there were there were American Nazi spies. So, um, well, no, and I'm in no way yeah. disagreeing with that at all. No, there was there was definitely a concern. Looking back on it, we kind of went crazy with it, but. Yeah. At the root of it, it's like, yeah, I, I get that. It makes sense. And that's probably it. Start like I said, good. In, it's started out with good intentions. I feel like. Right. And then they kind of. I have the, a sneaking suspicion though that this is about ready to go off the rails based on all the pieces that you're putting together. I am putting some pieces together a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just I'm setting it up a little bit. Anytime you spend the first third of an episode being like good intentions, they had good intentions. <laughs> I'm yeah. waiting for like dolphins to get laser beams on their heads. Like I'm waiting for like stuff to start blowing up. Like, yeah. yeah. So subsequently released documents show the fear of foreign invasion was soon eclipsed. Uh, did I already talk about this? Um, you, I have a different document than you, by the way. Yeah. So, um, I have released transcripts of U.S. State Department security briefings. Is my next. Oh yeah. Oh, I, I scrolled back up. I'm sorry. That's what happened. I, I hit my mouse and scrolled. I'm like, didn't I just say this? Did I not say this? Anyway, we're back on the rails now. Let's keep going. All right. So, so released transcripts of the U.S. State Department security briefing regarding Europe, Europe between 1947 and 1948 showed the security services were becoming increasingly concerned about the rising popularity of European communist, par uh, communist parties, especially in Italy. They offered the opinion that the ruling moderate De Gasperi government uh, would, could suffer considerable losses to the communists in the 1948 election. They warned of a possibly significant communist influence within the European political establishment. In 1947, the U.S. National Security Act created the Central Intelligence Agency and handed over control of espionage and counter-espionage operations abroad to the director of the CAA, Rear Admiral Roscoe H. Hillencotter. The subsequent National Security Council, director on the Office of Special Projects, stated, quote, 
Covert operations are understood to be all activities, except as noted herein, which are conducted or sponsored by this government against hostile foreign states or groups in support of friendly foreign states or groups uh, but which are so planned and executed that any U.S. government responsibility for them is not evident to unauthorized persons and that if uncovered, the U.S. government can plausibly disclaim any responsibility for them. <laughs> Hey, you recognize Helen Cotter? I do. We've talked about him, haven't we? Yeah. Where do you recognize him from? Was he... Um, He's all over the place at this point. He, he would have been around like an MK-12 and stuff, wouldn't he? He apparently was in MK-12. And he also... There's apparently a space battleship named after him. That that, right. that, 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 British act- hot, that that the British hacker saw a picture of. Yes, that's right. Yeah. So, say We talked about that just a couple weeks ago, didn't we? Yeah, we did. Hill and Cotter is all over this. Yeah. I didn't even know. I didn't even catch that one weaving in. Yeah, it's just that's all unintentional. Weird. <laughs> okay. So plausible deniability remains a central tenet of covert operations to this day, Dennis. The document went on to list the forms these covert operations might take. This includes, quote, activities related to propaganda, economic warfare, Preventative direct action, including sabotage, anti-sabotage, demolition, and evacuation measures. Subversion against hostile states, including assistance to underground resistance movements, guerrillas, and refugee refugee liberation groups. And support of indigenous anti-communist elements in threatened countries of the free world. NSC Directive 4 and 4A added, quote, The present world situation requires the immediate strengthening and coordination of all foreign information measures of the U.S. government designed to influence attitude in foreign countries in a direction favorable to the attainment of its objectives, initiating and developing specific plans and programs designed to influence foreign opinion. The director of the CIA is believed to be an appropriate and adequate action by the council with reference to covert uh, phys- uh, psychological or physiological, sorry, operational operations abroad. And in enclosure, five of the directive, they clarified how these psychological warfare operations must be run. All right, what's psychological operations? Did I say physiological? Yeah, anyway, psychological, operations. psychological warfare operations, quote, must be run like this. The National Security Council has determined that in the interest of the world peace and U.S. national security, the foreign information activities of the U.S. government must be supplemented by covert psychological operations. The similarity of operational methods involved in covert psychological and intelligence activities and the need to ensure their secrecy and obviate costly duplication uh, renders the Central Intelligence Agency the logical agency to conduct such operations. Hence, the National Security Council directs the director of the CIA Central Intelligence to initiate and conduct, within the limit of the available funds, covert psychological operations. Following the communists' relatively poor showing in the 1948 general election, the alarm noted in the State Department's transcript seems somewhat misplaced. Italian but the current, general election. What did I say? Just general election. This is oh, Italy. Sorry. Yeah, yeah this is Italy. Sorry, sorry, sorry. The yeah. Italian general election. Um, so the, they said that the, the fears were misplaced, but the fear of communists persisted and defined the Cold War for the next 40 years. The exposure of Gladio revealed that support of indigenous anti-communist elements practically meant the financing, equipping, equipping and training of neo-Nazis and other terrorist groups. Yeah. For example, the 1978 kidnapping and assassination of Italian Prime Minister Aldo Moro and five of his staff the Oktoberfest bombing in Munich in 1980 that killed 13 and injured 211, and the series of Brabant massacre, uh, massacres that took place in Belgium between 1982 and 1985, killing 28 people and injuring 40, were all linked to Gladio. That was a slow buildup to that stuff, man. You went from, like, here's the bureaucracy to, like, Here's hundreds of people being murdered, oh, like out. in the middle of a sentence. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> You're like, well, the State Department, 
uh, went on to form this board, which directed that board to kill 1,000 people all yep. across Europe. Oh, my yep. gosh, dude. Yep. They killed a prime minister of Italy? And five of his staff, yeah. And Wasn't playing ball. A little too socialist. Munich. I know about the Munich bombing. That was that was us. And then, oh my gosh. Mm-hmm. Man, no wonder other countries were like laughing at us about the war in Iraq. They're like, yeah, you do your own thing. <laughs> like, just bombed us 20 years ago. Oh my gosh. Oh, it's gonna get worse. Okay. The notion presented by the European Parliament that gladio operatives were involved in serious cases of terrorism was correct, but only told half the story. It neglected to mention that gladio operatives were involved in serious cases of false flag terrorism. Considering the thousands murdered by gladio operatives over the 40 years of its proven existence, why they committed these uh, barbarous attacks seems a secondary issue. The reality is, at some level, Western intelligence agencies and security services were involved in the orchestration of terrible crimes committed against civilians and throughout Europe and beyond. There is a wealth of corroborating evidence which proves the fact beyond reasonable doubt. However, if we are to understand why some people called conspiracy theorists continue to question official narratives of terrorist attacks today, it is important to first consider both the rationale that, that lay behind the Gladio false flag operations and their psychological operational role. Thousands of people. Okay. Yeah, and you're gonna. It's gonna make sense. I know it was kind of a slow build, but it kind of yeah. had. You fully have to understand the scope of how this thing's put together. Right. No, it was an interesting slow build. Don't get me wrong. No, but no, no, no. That that went from like here's the bureaucracy to like thousands of people dying. Yeah, that's okay. Wow. It, it, it was kind of a mix between weaving it all together, but it made more sense to kind of make you understand. Because otherwise, a lot of these things, if you just talk about them independently, sound crazy. they sound crazy and they don't sound yeah. connected at all, unless you know there's these pieces moving all together behind the right. scenes. Right. Yeah. No, this is really good, man. So in another incident in May of 1972, three Italian police officers were killed when a suspicious car they were investigating exploded. Known as the Petiano bombing. The far-left terrorist group, the Red Brigade, who Alicio Gelli had helped to create, <laughs> were blamed for the murders. So they started a communist group and then used the communist group to... Okay, wow. All right. Yep, you got it. That's... Yep, that's it. All right. Man, that really makes you think about what's going on with Antifa and stuff right now. How, um, many, of, how many of those groups... Okay, Let's those going. feelings are going to about to set in a lot harder as we move through this. But yes, yeah. that's exactly by the end of this. That's yeah. Spoiler. That's exactly where I'm at with a lot of my thinking on so much of this stuff now. Wow. Uh, so they were the Red Brigade got blamed for the for these murders, but no trial ever took place. An explosive expert, Marco Morin, submitted a report which stated the explosives used were the same as those previously employed by the Red Brigade terror group. This was deemed sufficient for the Italian authorities to crack down on the Red Brigade and other known communists. A series of raids took place, and more than 200 left-wing activists were arrested. And they're like, what's up, bro? We didn't do that. And they're like, yeah, you did. Yeah, you did. We know you did. Because you're because you're ex Nazi bro who started you secretly through NATO. <laughs> this is oh man. Oh man, this is why I don't vote. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Please vote. Please vote. <laughs> First you vote, next thing you know, they're blaming a bombing on you. <laughs> so they said, you know, the bombs were the kind the Red Brigade used, rounded a bunch of them up. It wasn't until Twelve years later, Dennis, 1984, when Italian judge Felice Casson reopened the investigation into the Petiano bombing, that the anomalies in the case became evident. Oh yeah, there were anomalies, Dennis. Let me talk about those for a minute. Casson discovered there had been no investigation of the scene of the bombing, <laughs> and Marin's explosive report was actually a forgery. His investigation showed the explosive used was actually of the military-grade kind, the high-grade kind, and it was explosive C4. 
He uncovered another incident in 1972. Same judge, different incident, 1972. So same year that the bo- uh, that this uh, bombing happens, where the Italian police had found a weapon cache in Trieste uh, containing C4, which was kept quiet by the Italian authorities. This led Kasson to identify a national network of hidden NATO arms, explosives, and new munitions stockpiles that were used by Gladio operatives. The C4 used in the bombing came from an arsenal concealed in Verona. My mind is going a million miles a minute. You know what I'm thinking about now? Lebanon. Why was there a bunch of explosives at a dock that wasn't supposed to be there? If we're doing this in Europe, are we doing this in other countries? (laughs) Like, what's going on here? Oh, my gosh. You know that al-Qaeda fought against the communists when uh, USSR tried to invade Afghanistan? (laughs) They're the exact equivalent, except for Nazis. They're Islamists in Afghanistan. Yep. Oh. I mean, I've been reading about it all day. But it still hurts to hear somebody else say it to me. <laughs> oh, this is hurting my brain. I stuff finally get to stuff that I thought was me. like insane is like starting to make some kind of sense right now. This is not all right. Yeah, like I said earlier, uh, Italy and a, Belgium and I forget what the other country was that I mentioned at the beginning, all have admitted this stuff's real. This is yeah, like, right. Yeah, like, that's how we, we start. got a judge. We got a judge in Italy investigating it. Well, the parliament, the European, basically the forerunner to the EU, denounced it and admitted yep. that it exists. Yeah, yep. wow. Yep. So, Kassan ordered the arrest of Vincenzo Vinzi Guerrera, Guerrera, who was a member of the neo-Nazi parliament paramilitary group called the New Order. The bomb expert, Marco Marin, who falsified the explosives evidence in 1972... He was also a member of that group. Okay. Vincenzo, Vincenzo's testimony described the Gladio network of terrorist cells coordinated by the security services. Admitting responsibility for the uh, Petiano bombing, he stated that he had been assisted by Italian SID who had protected their asset by smuggling him to Spain following the murders. And just so we're clear, the Italian SID is the name of the Gladio group in Italy. Yes. Yeah, wow. So, well, it is wise to Which, be... wait, by, by the way, none of this came out till the 90s, right? And this guy's talking in the 80s, saying... Uh, this judge them. is doing it in the 80s, yes. Oh, wow. All right. There was different groups. The 90s was the prime minister of Italy testifying. So. Yeah. Well, what I'm saying is this is like proof that it's real because he's saying it before it's like public knowledge. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this judge is who's basically uncovering all this finally. Like after we, that. Whatever happened to the? Do we know what happened to the judge? <laughs> I didn't follow up. Nothing. I don't. Nothing bad happens to him. Okay. He lives out his life, I'm assuming. <laughs> There's so many people in this. It would have been too hard to follow up on it. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, I might go ahead and Google him in a minute. Um, Okay. So, like I said, he uh, he got smuggled out of Spain after the murders. And while it was wise to be cautious about claims made in court by criminals, Vincenzo's statements have been corroborated by others, such as the Italian and European Parliament, and are supported by both physical and documentary evidence. He was not known to have been a senior figure within the Gladio hierarchy. However, he was apparently well-informed and his statements were consistent with both the official disclosures and the investigation of Operation Gladio by others, including the judiciary. So we kind of don't trust him because he's like a criminal and stuff, but also like everything he says like links up to other stuff. And it's right. also, I don't know why he would be lying about that. No. So back to the prime minister, as we just kind of brought up again, uh, uh, when the prime minister of Italy had finally testified in 1990, he revealed that arms and equipment were provided by the CIA and placed in 139 underground caches across the country. (laughs) Side note, because I don't think I put it in here. 
Uh, they never recovered all those caches. There was like oh. 12 or 15 that were like missing. Of high grade C4. And weapons. Yeah. Just, yeah. Yep. So in March of 2011, uh, okay. Oh, I'm sorry. So Ger General uh, Giuliano, or uh, Giandelio Meletti, a former head of Italian counterintelligence in March 2001, confirmed the CIA's involvement. He stated that after the Piazza Fontana bombing in 1969, pieces of a bomb were planted in a leftist editor's villa in order to blame the communists. How would you, what is the logic behind that? Pieces of a bomb? Like he just like, well, I'm assuming it's like part of the bomb and like took it with him. Like I'm assuming construction materials. Oh, okay, okay, that makes. Okay, I'm dumb. Okay, like spare parts or something gotcha. that would have matched the bomb that went off. I don't know. I, I imagine like this matches the bomb. From I didn't the even think about that when I was putting it all down. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, just they planted something that pointed this person to having connection to the bomb in their house. Right. So he stated, "This is General Maletti." Quote, the CIA, following the directives of its government, wanted to create an Italian nationalism capable of halting what is saw as a slide to the left. And for this purpose, it may have made use of right wing terrorism. That's a guy who literally helped get supplies from the CIA. Uh... He, he, if anybody would know. Probably going to be that guy. So Probably they moved be. from let's have an army in case the Soviets come to let's have a secret army in case they beat our real army to we're bored. Let, let's the pot. to let's use our secret army against political groups we don't want to let's create political groups we don't want to do terrorist attacks. To let's just create our own party and get this over with and take over the country. <laughs> and they've done all the things. This is mission creep, man. This is mission creep. You're like, you know how you stop the Soviets from invading? You just become the Soviets. You just become the Soviets. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We don't have to stop ourselves then. This is like some serious, this is like bureaucrats and people with nothing to do. Like, yeah. Wow. That's how I felt as I dug into all this. Another Gladio hotspot, Dennis, Turkey. Oh, Tur I'm sure, yeah. Oh, man, Turkey. Whew. I almost wonder if it didn't go too well. If you look at Erdogan, if you look at the current leader, who's like ultra right wing. Yeah. I mean, I hadn't even thought about that. Just yeah. The way this weaves into everything is just like, it's so it, much. Well, you'd have to suspect if they did this in every country, every country they did it in, if they went ultra right wing, you'd have to wonder if that wasn't part of this. They want everybody to become ultra right wing. Yeah. So like Erdogan actually did it. So I'm starting to wonder, like, was he part of this? Because, well, OK, let's go. Possibly. Um, so during the Cold War, Turkey shared a third of the total of its total borders with the Soviet bloc and maintained the largest standing army in Europe and the second in NATO after the United States. In 1952, a stay behind army was organized under the code name Counter Guerrilla. On November 3rd in 1996, a truck crashed into Mercedes Benz in Susalurk, uh, 90 miles south of Istanbul and killed three Turkish passengers, a fugitive heroin smuggler and hitman, a former high-ranking police officer, and a former Miss Cinema. Okay. It's a group of people I know. The lone survivor was a, was a right-wing member of parliament. In the car's trunk, police found a forged passport, police identification papers, ammunition, silencers, and machine guns. Abdullah Kotli, the fugitive heroin smuggler, had escaped from a Swiss prison. The dead beauty queen, Gonka Uz, was his girlfriend. The police officer was Husawin Kakadag, head of a Turkish police academy and a former Istanbul deputy police chief who reportedly organized hit squads in the southeast 
that kill Kurdish guerrillas and their supporters. All right. The survivors, Sadat Bukak, a member of parliament from the conservative Truth Path Party, is reportedly in charge of 2,000 Kurdish mercenaries paid by the government to fight Kurdish guerrillas. The car crash had created a sensation in Turkey and had led parliament to hold hearings on the ties linking the Truth Party, the police, and thugs like Abdullah Kotli. Newspapers in Turkey are making connections between what they called the state gang and a secret paramilitary force that for decades had attacked the left. All right. The United States funded these stay-behind groups for decades. Even though there was no Soviet occupation, some of the groups did take up arms against left-wing dissidents in their own countries. Some dissidents of these groups are still at it, especially in Turkey. Abdullah Kaitley was one of those. Quote, the accident unveiled the dark liaisons within the state, former Prime Minister Bulent Esevit told Parliament. Uh, Bulent, Bulent uh, five-time Turkish Prime Minister, declared that the Tazkim Square Massacre was gladio operation where half a million citizens had rallied. It was organized by trade unions and the shooting lasted for 20 minutes, while a thousand policemen in attendance did absolutely nothing to intervene. Wow. Thousands. I've never heard of this. Stood there and watched, or a thousand policemen stood there and watched. About 40 people were killed, and though none of the perpetrators were caught, 500 demonstrators were detained, and the massacre occurred during a broader wave of political violence. So everybody uh, shot up, and then they start arresting the people that were there, like protesting. Wow! Gotta grab yeah. somebody. Wow! This is all um, feels oddly familiar right now, doesn't it? Like, uh, I don't know oh, my brain. Oh my brain, Patrick. Oh wow! This is in the late '90s. Yep. Yep. I want to look into Erdogan. So the U.S. State Department in its 1995 human rights report noted that, quote, prominent credible human rights organization, Kurdish leaders and local Kurds asserted that the government acquiesces in or even carries out the murder of civilians. Human rights groups reported the widespread and credible belief that counter guerrilla groups associated with the security force of the security forces had carried out at least some mystery killings. Mystery killings. Mystery killing. <laughs> we don't know how they happened. Well, no, we know who carried them out. This is the mystery killings. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So American journalist Lucy Commissar, when asking U.S. officials about investigating the human rights reports, was told, quote, that's classified. The Turkish military would likewise block all invasion investigations in their country. Nobody's playing ball with anybody trying to figure out what's going on with this. Stuff worked too well in Turkey. I'm convinced. I'm it's, convinced. I'm convinced they might have accidentally won. It's kind of seeming like it, right? Like they didn't have anything to do, so they just kind of took over and it worked. Yeah. Instead of creating like tension, like they just won. I assume they flip sides now and now they're finding I mean, the opposite of that. At now some point. Left. Yeah. I mean, mm, look at. Oh, okay. Yeah. It hurts a little, I know. There is evidence of Gladio operatives extensively operating torture campaigns for political purposes. For example, Talhat Tehran former Turkey general, survived torture at the hands of special forces. He was told, quote, I was now in the hands of a counter guerrilla unit operating under the high command of the army outside the Constitution and the laws. They told me they considered me as their prisoner of war and that I was sentenced to death. All right. Well, this is the law of the jungle, baby. This is international CIA stuff. Oh, my gosh. 
much of the violence was directed at the Kurdish minority. And back to the 80s, in 1984, the counter guerrillas were behind the brutal crackdown that would kill and torture thousands over the next five years. So all through the rest of the 80s. Among other operations, counter guerrillas would dress up as PKK members at Kurdish political party, and then they'd go attack villages, raping and executing people randomly. The political violence in Turkey, with Gladio operatives responsible to at least a moderate extent, extent paved the way for the series of military coups that have, occur have occurred in the country. A 1996 New York Times article noted that, quote, evidence suggests that officially sanctioned criminality may have reached levels that few had imagined. Well, remember, um, Erdogan had a fake coup a few years ago. Yes. Yep. Yep. Well, it's officially not fake, but. That's not, it's barely a conspiracy. Anyone who watched that on the news saw that as fake. I don't, I, yeah. It was in 2016, the military rose up for like an hour and then, yeah, yeah it was, and then, and then all of a sudden all of his political enemies were put away. Like, yeah. Yeah. yeah this, you know, might've, might've been something like Gladio, basically. I looked it up by the way. Go ahead. I couldn't, con I couldn't connect uh, Erdogan to it yet, but uh, just based on a little, little quick thing while I was listening to you, um, there is the term deep state actually starts out with the Turkish deep state. And for years and years and years, politicians in Turkey have been like, there is a problem here. It starts with Gladio and they've like talked about it for years. Really? Yeah. I didn't realize they were that. Look up the Wikipedia article, the Turkish deep state. Yeah. Well, they were the first one. You know what? They I, were the first ones to join Gladio, pretty much. More and more, the more we read about all this stuff, I'm like, ah, the people spouting it don't really understand what they're talking about, I feel like, with Deep State, but there's definitely something going on here. Yeah, I know. It's that way with everything. And, I, and I'm also like, also the way it kind of gets drugged through the mud and discredited, I'm like, oh, that's their propaganda working. Yeah. it's a, That's, yeah. If you, they're going to want to discredit it. So I'm like, is that why we see like the dumbest people spouting that stuff? Like a fair majority of the time. Either that or, or or half of what they say is true and half of it isn't. Yeah, that's and awesome. You, and, you, and you'll never know which half. Well, and the way they like to kind of twist. Well, that's another thing that gets done in counterintelligence. I think I left it out here, but they intentionally, I think we've talked about it at some point. Yeah. We'll put out false info. Oh, I think you talked about it on the last one you did. They put out false put out info. Oh, they'll put out mostly true info or mostly false info, but they'll mix truth or false into it. That way you can discredit true things and you can, yeah, it's it's a big Spread mess. Spread disinformation in general just to... Right, 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 right. You, you put a small untrue thing and a mostly true thing to spread disinformation, or you put true things you want to keep secret in mostly false things. That way, nobody will ever believe it. Yeah, that's a common tactic. Yeah. So, one of Turkey's most prominent pro Kurdish politicians, Guven Azata, said the car crash and its aftermath had convinced him that state sponsored death squads were behind many of the estimated 3,500 unsolved killings that had been committed in the southeastern part of the country <laughs> in the prior decade. Most of the victims had been suspected of sympathizing with separatist Kurdish causes. Quote from Mr. Azado, these gangs have a direct link with mystery killings. This is no longer a hypothesis or a guess. It is a reality acknowledged by government officials. Several politicians and others who are calling for investigations into the government's relationship with criminal, criminal gangs believe that the gangs use their official ties as cover for involvement in Turkey's lucrative heroin smuggling trade. <laughs> they suspect it as a way of repaying gangs that killed at their behest. Thanks for uh, off on those guys. Go sell your heroin. We don't actually have to do anything. We just let you do your thing. You're happy you can do that. We get to kill people. Everybody wins except for the murder victims. You're muted. Is this like the natural human state that... Well, you know I what? I we're going to have video of you just freaking out, but with no... I know. <laughs> you know what? I'm going to wait to the end because I have this 
I have this theory that if we have time, I want to talk about it. That, okay. Just briefly. So the evidence of Gladio operations in Turkey reveal another important link. The collusion between paramilitary forces and drug traffickers. At the time, and to this day, Turkey served as a major hub in the smuggling of drugs into Western Europe. From the Southeast Asian Golden Triangle and later the Middle East, it is likely that drugs served as a significant source of funding for these decentralized operations and was the catalyst for a bond between the state and the criminal underworld that ensured massive corruption in the country that exists to this day. Just After, like the Iran-Contra crack in L.A. episode. Yep. Same thing. It's the same playbook. And I think we're finding that as we delve further and further into this. It's like the same. They've been running the same schemes for well over 100 years. And it's because they work. Yeah. Don't fix it if it isn't broke. It's, it's so almost cool. it's almost like if you do one bad thing, you're going to get caught. But if you do like 18 bad things or like, you know, if you kill one person over a drug deal, it's like, well, then it's really easy to catch you and put you away. If you kill 3,500 people as part of trading millions of tons of drugs and part of this, then it's like, how do you prove that? Yep. It's such a massive yeah. Yeah, it's almost like the bigger the crime, the harder it is to to prove or, or to or to make people believe. It's almost like it's beyond belief. Well, it's it's a larger scale version of the mob. Yeah, that's all it is. Yeah. <laughs> Except they're the people that would prosecute the mob, so there's nobody to prosecute them or go after them, really. I mean, theoretically, but yeah. All right. Yeah. So after all, we know that the Gellin organization was, oh, say, so like I said, uh, corruption still exists in the country to this day. After all, we know that the Gellin organization was involved in the black market in the area uh, to raise extra funds for their, their intelligence operations. It seemed that this practice spread throughout the web of stay behind armies, financed and armed by the CIA and NATO. So, yeah, I mean. If you were doing what you were doing in the 80s, like the CIA was doing with crack and cocaine and drug smuggling from South America, if you're doing similar operations in other countries, why wouldn't you go ahead and use their drug trade, too? Yeah. What would make it any different? You don't have to create a paper trail within the government of funding. Like, you can create your own funding. You wouldn't even need money from the government to start your illegal money. You just it's just like yeah. you have your own government, basically. Kind of. Kind of, yeah. So uh Vinci Guerrero, uh, back to him, described the purpose of the false flag attacks. He said, quote, You had to attack civilians, the people, women, children, innocent people, unknown people far removed from any political game. The reason was quite simple. They were suppo supposed to force these people, the Italian public, to turn to the state to ask for greater security. This was precisely the role of the right in Italy. It placed itself at the service of the state, which created a strategy aptly called the strategy of tension. Insofar as they had to get ordinary people to accept that at any moment, over a period of 30 years, from 1960 to the mid-80s, a state of emergency could be declared. So people would willingly trade part of their freedom for the security of being able to walk the streets, go on trains or enter a bank. This is the political logic behind all the bombings. They remain unpunished because the state cannot condemn itself. Right, right. So the strategy, uh, the strategy of tension, as described by Vincent Guerra, uh, was inevitably or uh, evidently behind the Gladio attacks from the late 60s onward. It seems likely the operation moved away from being a defensive countermeasure to being used in the event of foreign occupation to an offensive campaign designed to manipulate public opinion in the early 60s. That's like the exact same thing we were saying like yeah, 20 minutes ago, yeah. So one um, of the released documents related to Gladio was the 1959 Servizio Informazano the Visitadel, uh it's the Armed Forces uh, report, uh, I believe, from Italy. Yeah. Uh, it clearly defined the main threat as coming from homegrown communist groups 
rather than Soviet military invasion. It also suggested that Gladio operation could be used to address this problem. Strategy of tension was firmly identified as being an integral element of Gladio by Italian investigators. It refers to the use of both violent means, such as terrorism and assassination, as we've talked about, and nonviolent, as we've also talked about, like propaganda and economic warfare, to create states of fear and uncertainty among the, among the populace. The purpose being to convince the public of the reality of the insurgent danger. So the objective was to foster social division, disorient the public, and foment unrest. This enabled elements within the deep state to achieve a number of objectives. These included, but weren't limited to, the manipulation of elections, as you were kind of talking about a little bit ago, mm -hmm. uh, providing justification for military action, the persecution of those who question the state as, unpa as unpatriotic or traitors, and the creation of public demand for further state controls as a means of public protection. This is a uniquely American brand of tyranny, it seems like, with the CIA that we export, where, you know, they say one thing about tyranny is that it's always capricious. Mm -hmm. You never really know what the right or wrong rule is. So one guy can walk down the street and get a hot dog. The other guy can walk down the street and get a hot dog, and they'll just arrest one of them and say, hey, hot dogs are illegal. It's kind of like if you fund both sides and you make a civil war, then it, you basically, if you're controlling both sides, you can control anything that happens. Yeah. Anybody can bomb anybody. Anyone can be arrested for any reason on either side. You can create com complete secreting and capriciousness by through what appears to be democracy well and that goes back to i mean is uh, there's that was what happened in like uh europe during the like napoleonic wars or whatever like the european banks funded both or not the europe the rothschilds yeah. funded both sides right right i guess it's not and unique. that's how they got that's how they originally got uber rich was right as opposed to a dictator that says you do whatever i say today even if it's different than yesterday you have to do it Basically, you create a scenario where there's there's quote unquote stability and rule of law, but because so much crazy stuff is happening, you basically get to do whatever you want. Yep. Yeah. Again, feeling very familiar. Yeah, this feels oddly. Oh wow. Oh man. I mean, get, look. I mean, we're America. We have protests. You know, we had the '60s and the '70s, but oh man. <laughs> this, but now it's this kind of is just in an election year. Oh man, it just makes you wonder, man. It makes, oh, yeah, you, wonder it makes you wonder who's funding all the, who. Well, and all the radical stuff that happens. Like, is that really why every time change tries to get brought about, there ends up being this like whole other wave of people hijacking it and doing things that are violent and discredit the movement of whatever that movement is. Right, just like your Agent Provocateurs episode. Yeah, and that's exactly kind of what this is, except this goes even higher up, essentially. Like. Mm -hmm. And who really, who really knows? I mean, I, you know, I'm not going to get political here, but like, how many people do you really know who are Antifa or the three percenters or, you know what I mean? On either side of this whole thing, like who really yeah. knows these people? But apparently there's thousands and thousands of them. It just, it makes you wonder. Yeah. I don't know. It makes me wonder like how much is real, you know, frankly. I mean, I don't, you know, I have no idea. Yeah, no. So you could describe this process of state manipulation as problem, reaction, solution. The state creates the problem, then through the use of its controlled media organization, restricts the narrative in order to manipulate the public's reaction. This then provides the state with the opportunity to offer the solution of choice. It can also be seen as the creation of order out of chaos, based upon the principles of divide and rule. Right. Given what we know about Gladio, this kind of seems like a reasonable description of how state false flag terror was used to shape public opinion in Italy during the years of lead. Gladio also raised another perhaps even less comfortable likelihood. It seems clear that elected sovereign governments did not have operational command. This suggests there was another form of government hidden from both the public and many within the political establishment that was operating beyond the rule of law without democratic oversight or control as we've said before, a deep state. 
Some senior establishment figures, such as Andriotti, Gelli, and Leminster, uh, knew about Gladio, as did some terrorist extremists, extremists like uh, Vincingero, or yeah, Vincingero, who were employed to murder civilians under its authority. However, the likely use of compart compartmentalization implies only a small minority of those involved would have possessed a complete grasp of the operation's overall objectives. Mm -hmm. It was these individuals, including many committed Nazis and neo-fascists, who had effectively formed a parallel European government, able to utilize significant state resources without any constraint to achieve whatever aim they saw fit. The people who were funding these activities, the public, were the last to know about them because they were its target. Vincenzo um, uh, Vincenguera, again, speaking about the existence of the secret government structure, said, with the massacre of Petignano and with all those that have followed, the knowledge should now be clear that there existed a real life structure, occult and hidden, with the capacity of giving a strategic direction to the outrages lies within the state itself. There exists in Italy a secret force parallel to the armed forces composed of civilians and military men in an anti-Soviet capacity, that is, to organize a resistance on Italian soil against a Russian army. A secret organization, a super organization with a network of communications, arms, and explosives, and men trained to use them. A super organization, which, lacking a Soviet military invasion, which might not happen, took up the task, on NATO's behalf, of preventing a slip to the left in the political balance of the country. This they did with the assistance of the official secret services and the political and military forces. Yeah, mission creep. Yeah. Gladio proves that state-sponsored false flag terrorism against the host country's own population is a matter of historical fact. The inability and frequent refusal of others to even look at the evidence can be disheartening unless we recognize the reality of state terrorism. These crimes will continue. This can only lead society towards never-ending conflict and oppression. And a quote from Donald Rumsfeld. <laughs> uh, uh, uh. <laughs> <laughs> Air horns. <laughs> there are known knowns. There are things we know that we know. There are known unknowns. That is to say, there are things that we know we don't know. But there are also unknown unknowns. There are things we don't know we don't know. That's actually one of my favorite modern quotes because it because it sounds like complete nonsense. But it but makes when, so much sense. But when you read it slowly, it's like one of the most profound things you've yes. ever. Yeah. So the 1990 European Parliament resolution on the Gladio affair asked the states involved to purge their respective Gladio infestations. Yet to date, only Belgium, Italy, and Switzerland have ever launched any related inquiries. If the purpose of Gladio as described by Vincent Guerra, then it was a success. People across, Euro across Europe were repulsed by far-left terrorism. They did, not turn, they did turn to the state for protection. So is it reasonable to ask if the strategy of tension ended with the official exposure of Gladio? Are there any grounds to believe it continued? Can we still see evidence of its implementation today? Does it? Uh, wow. I wonder, my, my, my initial response is, hell no, it never went anywhere. Nope. These things never go anywhere. My question is, how Not does they this, work? How has this changed with like immigration to Europe with like so many Muslims? You know what I mean? Like, has this, um, have any of those attacks, like the train attack in Spain or has any of that been part of this? Yeah, it does make you wonder. Well, I don't think we'd know yet. No, we would. Well, we're not like, gonna we'll probably like reflect. Years. I was going to say we will reflect on this in like 20 years and be like, yep, that was what was going on there. Yeah, it makes you wonder. We're, we're reflecting on it from the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s and 90s. It didn't just as with anything they do, they say they quit and then they just keep on doing it, usually under a different name. And they and it became exposed right after the end of the Cold War in the 90s. And, you know, it's easy to say right wing Nazi, but 
keep in mind these are not this was not a nazi plot this was us using nazis yep. so with that infrastructure after we no longer needed the nazis what's the new people they're using it could be anything it could be right wing it could be left wing it could be religious extremists Th this well, infrastructure based on all this i doubt it's left wing it doesn't seem like it's a well but at the time the but what i'm saying Unless is it's it america well what i'm saying is at the time it's america and britain using left-wing flag attacks to stop the Soviet Union. Once the Soviet Union doesn't exist, who's your enemy now? Who's the false flag? Is it the Middle East? It could even be the right wing. It's whoever they think is their enemy. Because yeah. these are not. this is not the Nazis. This is the CIA using Nazis. Yeah. And all those people are dead, and we beat the Soviet Union. So it, it's it's scary because... It might not necessarily look like what it was then, and maybe that's why we found out about it, is they're done using Nazis. And they go, oh, it's our bad. We use Nazis. Uh, we're done now. And the next thing you know, who knows, maybe an al-Qaeda attack is is Operation Gladio 2.0. You don't know. You don't know who they're using. Oh, I honestly think a lot of that is. I also, I, and locally, like in our country, I think like what we talked about in the Agent Provocateurs episode as it related to, in general, but I know we were relating a lot of it to the riots that were happening and have been happening, but when they started a few months ago, yeah. they're still going because stuff is still a mess. Um, but yeah, it's it makes you wonder how much and I'm of not a saying, I'm not a 9-11 conspiracy theorist. I'll say that right now. I think Al Qaeda did 9-11. I don't think that we had any part of it. We can mm. have a whole discussion about that. I don't believe in any of that. But it may it puts it puts every but it at least puts everything in question. You at least have to ask when you witness a, a terrorist act, like who does it benefit? And and you have to know it's at least possible that stuff like this could happen. Well, I I I think I'm on the other side of this 9/11. Oh uh, man, we're gonna have a whole. We should at, have a debate episode. <laughs> at some point, I feel like I'm gonna have to now do 9/11 as a research episode. Oh, and bring man. all the conspiracy. And it's, it's okay. Even after <laughs> hearing all this, it doesn't kind of make you go maybe 9/11 was something. Well, like I said, everything's on the table. Every, at this every... point, after I did all this, I'm, I mean, I'd already kind of felt that way, but now to see how intricate it actually is. And they're only going to get – they've only gotten better at it over time. They didn't – you, Yeah, I understand. But you also – I mean, here's why I say everything's on the table because this exists. False flags exist. But also real-life terrorist organizations exist. Real-life mobsters exist. Like not everything is part of something like this. No, not you necessarily. Know what I'm saying? So, so like you can't just say because this existed and Op Operation Northwoods existed, any terrorist attack is a false flag. That's like the whole Alex Jones like. Well, no, I'm not. I'm not taking it that far, but no, do I understand I think what you're saying. They might have some sort of tie to almost every group at some level, Maybe. probably. I mean, Anybody I, that they is significant enough that it's on their radar, yeah, I think they're probably infiltrating and trying to, yeah, on a long scheme, trying to infiltrate and then influence yeah. them. I mean, you can't discount that. I mean, that's true. I mean, that's just like saying that, like, the KGB also, the Soviets, were also doing similar things to this. But you can't say the Soviet Union controlled everything. You know what I mean? Because there's also the CIA. Like, there are yeah. independent groups that are all trying to infiltrate each other. So yeah. just to reduce it down to this one group, is that's why I say I'm not a 9-11 experience. Because to me, the evidence, even with stuff like this, still, I can't believe we're... But, I mean, all the stuff in America, like this, you can't listen to what we just listened to, everything you were just reading, and not think about stuff happening in America. Uh, to me, I'm not – because to me, the overwhelming evidence is that it's a, it was a competing group. Now, that doesn't mean we don't do dark things, but, I mean, it's all – Well, we know off. we funded Al-Qaeda at one point. We did, yeah, correct. Yeah, we also know that we uh, that we teamed up with Russia to beat the Nazis. And then we became enemies. You know what I mean? Like, I, I, yeah, I mean, it's an interesting discussion. Like, you can't take anything off the table. What I was going to say earlier is I'm starting to wonder, the more of these conspiracy theories we do, it's starting to make me worry about humanity. You know how, like, before a thousand years ago, how all we had was tribes and it was just the biggest guy who'd beat you over the head? Maybe, like, whatever I tell you, I kind of feel like, man, did anything change? <laughs> Or is it just all in secret? You know what I mean? Like, are we just, are we, can the we definition, have, The definition can we, of size that overpowers the rest of the tribe has changed, but no. But, but have we ever, have we ever escaped the, 
the idea of basically being ruled by a warlord, the guy who sells the most drugs. And you know what I mean? Like what we think, you know, is it all an illusion? It makes me wonder. It's an, I honestly feel like it's more of an illusion than anything. Oh, man. We're going to get picked up. <laughs> probably. I'll see you in the van, Dennis. I'll see you in the van. <laughs> Oh, I won't Although recognize, I won't probably we won't recognize it with the bags over our head. Yeah, I was going to say, we're going to bags over our head. You know what? What? what when they're waterboarding us, I will sing, um, I will sing, uh, Sweet Caroline, ba, 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 as they're waterboarding me, so you'll know it's me. I'll get in this with was, the This was deep, man. Thank you for this episode. This was nuts. It was a weird one. Um, yeah. Everybody enjoyed it or is upset probably now. I'm sorry, but... This is, I guess, what we do. <laughs> I'll find a way to just build it into my view of the world and just keep moving on. Yeah, you're going to have to. Tomorrow morning, I'm going to be pulling up to McDonald's at 1029, and they won't have McMuffins, and I'll be upset about that. So we'll just well, we'll that see. Was, that's probably Claudio, too. So. <laughs> well, thank you all so much for listening. We appreciate you. Again, like, rate, subscribe, comment, uh, tell your friends, send it to somebody. Yeah. Write us and tell us nice things. We appreciate all of it, and we're going to keep doing it. So we'll be back next week with something else. And keep an eye on the YouTube channel. I should have mentioned earlier, keep an eye on the YouTube channel for other stuff that we're doing just on YouTube, uh, headline stories, um, more real current event stuff, and shorter form stuff as well. Broken so. down segments you can share with your friends. Just We're really trying to diversify and if you're not watching this on YouTube, if you're listening to this as a podcast, you can actually watch us do this now on YouTube. Um, however you want to get it, um, we appreciate it. So just keep on doing that. So you got to tune in to see Patrick's beautiful face. Dennis's beautiful beard. Oh, yeah, please. So we'll be back next week. Uh, like I said, we'll be on YouTube even sooner than that, though. So thank you so much. And we'll be back. Bye.